Good afternoon, everybody. I know we're already running a little bit behind, so I sort of want to get this moving a bit. So we've got three excellent speakers in this session looking at genomics and proteomics. And um, I'm very honored to induce, introduce all three of them in my first ever ses session sharing. So it's a good trio to start with. First up, we've got um, Dr. Neil McGregor, who's going to be talking about his work looking at the link between symptom presentation and the metabolome, the microbiome, and the genome. So, Dr. McGregor. Thank you. When I joined the Stanford collaboration, uh, and I, I didn't really interact with a lot of uh, other researchers. That, that everybody tried to tend to keep their data separate. So I have to thank Ron for inviting me to there. And I also have to thank all the other people that have allowed me access to their data. And I'm going to try. So Ron also challenged us to develop a hypothesis so we could test it. So I'm going to go out on a limb and put, a, put some data down and propose a, a molecular basis for what we see in CFS people. So if you don't understand, I've got a very, I've got a, a lot of slides, a lot of information, so I might have to talk fast, um, but we'll see what happens. So the first question is, what is a metabolome? It is what, what we have. We have metabolomes from serum, urine, faecal matter, and you eat, but you can get them from saliva, you can get them from lots of different things. But what are they? They are a dynamic changing mix of metabolites, and those metabolites will be affected by epigenetic, genetic, and, and disease processes. So exercise will alter them, fasting, m metabolite deprivation, inflammation, diet, autoantibodies, different types of pathogens. Some will be acute stimuli, some will be chronic. So what I'm trying to do, some will be altered related to uh, gene expression, and gene expression will be different within different tissues, and if the gene expression is altered, um, in, in, sorry, if the metabolite components are altered in such a manner that it uh, influences the biochemistry of whatever that sub-tissue is, that is the tissue that's likely to develop a symptom. Um, there may be metabolite transport anomalies and all that sort of thing, so we're looking at a soup a molecular soup that is, uh, we have to try and work out how to analyse it and understand it. So a couple of things, if we look at the people that report an infectious onset compared with the others, as you, you can see in the top right, I got that right, thanks. Um, you'll see that we, we can separate people that report an infectious onset from the remainder, and we can separate them from the controls. If we look at the people that have sudden onset versus gradual onset, we can also separate them from controls and from each other. And the same goes for virtually every major symptom set, the cognition set, the depression, anxiety set, um, so what we're really looking at is these metabolomes can allow us to differentiate between each of these symptom sets and other things. So what I'm going to talk about is the prime discriminant um, thing for chronic fatigue syndrome. And as you can see in there, what, what we did was we got them to score their, how they in the last seven days, how bad was their payback? Or how bad was their post-exercise malaise and their symptom sets? So, and when they, when they plotted it all out, um, we can see that we're, their reporting is accurate enough to allow us to separate them into subgroups. And this particular one, there was one control. There's one control, you can probably, is a blue one in amongst all the green ones. So that, that, that's about the only, otherwise it was separable by 
So what this says to me is that these post-exertional things do have a chemistry of their own. So that means we should be able to find out what that is. So when we look at all that, now I've got, I could go on for an hour just about this, but what in essence we've got is we can see an alteration in glucose and lactate. The glucose, now what we did was we took first of morning samples um, and most of the other metabolome studies used to our postprandial, which they collected during the day. Uh, ours were collected first, first morning urines, and then the moment they can get to the clinic, we, we got their blood. So what that meant is we're going to see probably the underlying chemistry with less influence from other factors. And from that we can see there's a, definitely a glycolytic deregulation. There was low ATP levels and it, because there's, there appeared to be low hyperxanthine, what that told me, there's low ATP breakdown products. So that means more than likely they've got low ATP and low ATP reserves. What we also found is the, the amino acids that are normally carried in muscle um, basically are all low. And what we found is when we actually looked at the severity of their post-exercise scores, we found that there was a diuresis pattern, so they were urinating. There was a dramatic increase in the m amount of metabolite in the patient's urine in relation to their score. So, a as they, as they, as their payback was worse, they were excreting more metabolite than if they, if they were sedentary and not, and not didn't have a, such a thing. So, real question is, do we see this multi-system thing anywhere else? And we do. A whole series of chronic diseases have what we call a hypermetabolic or hypercatabolic state. Now, they use the word hypermetabolic. I don't really think that's correct. I would prefer to look at it as a cell cycle switching anomaly, where they've switched from one form of energy provision to another to another. So. It's part, and we see these sort of patterns in burns patients, trauma patients, post-surgery, sepsis, and even severe stress, we, we see that. Some of those will be normally uh, recover. Most of the people in this room, apart from the sufferers, we get subject to one of these responses. We get over it within four to six weeks but we find that the CFS people don't do that. So somehow or other they get stuck over into this shifted metabolic state. So if we compare the types of things we see, if we look at burns pages and then we look at chronic fatigue people, do we see the same things? We see an insulin issue in both. We see loss of amino acids in both. We see an increase in connective tissue degradation. So we see biomarkers for that would be the their hydroxyproline levels, uh, increases in um, pyrrolidine 5-carboxylase. They are components of, of connective tissue breakdown. And that seems to be the reason why the, the hype joint hypermobility people are more susceptible to this, because they seem less able to provide that to respond to the stimulus. We see an alteration in, in triglycerides. Uh, we see an alteration in cortisol. We, the, one of the really interesting things we see in Burns patients, and that's by a study by Porter et al. 2015, uh, they found that there was a switch in the mitochondria from uh, ATP production to a thermogenic response. If you listened to the very first lecture yesterday morning, he described such. Thank you, Paul. Sorry, you, you didn't do the work. <laughs> and we also see gut barrier dysfunction. And, and all of these other, the, the Burns patients and all these sorts of things, we see all these things in all of them. But what appears to be the, the major problem with our CFS people 
is that they have a definite alteration in glucose tolerance. And you can see here, I've classified them into three groups. And based upon the glucose movement, there's one group that are normal, which is the green ones. And when you look at their insulin response, it was normal. The blue ones are the ones that had a truncated response. So normally the, the glucose should peak around one hour, but th these guys are peaking at 30 minutes. And, and at one hour, they're, they're traveling south at a rapid rate. So that means the insulin is definitely having some influence upon their glucose uptake rate. And we also see a flat response group, and they comprise 10%, 55 and 35% of this study lot, which is 47 versus 25, I think. So I went back to our, the boss who collects all these people, Don Lewis, and said, give me what you've got. So he gave me a file of 1,155 um, glucose tolerance tests. Uh, I cleaned the data and eliminated all those that do not have a, um, that were not complete. So I ended up with 777 which I think is a very good sample size, and I, I have to truncate my p-values to make sure I'm not over, over judging them. What we saw is 6.9% were flat, 82.5% were truncated, and 10.6% were normal. So that clearly tells me that these people have a glucose tolerance anomaly of significance. And when we looked at the, the glucoses at rest or at, at fasting rate and compared them with the glucoses at 60 minutes, what we found is the, the flat people were six-fold, 6.6-fold more likely to be hypoglycemic or have lower levels in their resting rate at, at 60 minutes. The females had slightly lower levels and at fasting and at 30 minutes and somewhere at around about 20 or basically 30% of them had, had a, in, in essence, a hyperglycemic response at 60 minutes. If we'd, re if we'd continue these on, I'm sure the large number of the, the truncated ones, because you can see the, the, the rate that they were going south, I'm sure they would have been hyperglycemic as well. So this, to me, seems to be one of the major underlying reasons why there's an increase in susceptibility in this particular patient group. So the next thing is, do these different glucose tolerance patterns have any other anomalies? The first thing we found is the, the flat group definitely had um, much lower creatine, creatinine levels. And the other thing that was really important was the anti-nuclear antibody, me teta, was significantly elevated. So that suggests that this particular group, the flat tolerance group, basically appeared to have an autoimmune relationship to the reason why it's flat. When we looked at the truncated lot, what we saw is they had low ureas and low creatine. So what a lot of low urea is means that they're depleted in nitrogen and the creatine tells us they've actually lost their high, their second or one of their tertiary high energy phosphate um, energy systems. And that's particularly important in muscle, brain and, and cardiac tissue. Um, what, if we took the people out that were hyperglycemic, um, what we found is that those all had real, they had higher hyperxanthines than the remainder. So what that tells me is they're degrading ATP at a more rapid rate. So being hyperglycemic probably is depleting them of ATP and that is a significant reason for them having fatigue issues. So what we need to do is we need to know how these things move together. Now what we have here is, is a 40 cyclists, sort of 40 cyclists of um, 
professional cyclists, and what they got them to do was perform exactly the same exercise. They took blood samples at zero before they took off, at one at 10 minutes when they, got, when they finished their 75 kilometre cycle, uh, one at 75, one at one and a half hours, one at three, one at four and a half, one at 21 hours, and one at 45 hours. And what you can see is the arginine, which, which is the, one of the is the major component within the urea cycle. You can see that as it elevates, so does creatine. So, and we know from the biochemistry that, that arginine is the precursor. So, if we got low creatines in people it's likely that we're not, um, we're not creating enough arginine or something like that, or the urea cycle is redirecting it to one of the other four methods that has of eliminating arginine. Now, we need to know what happens normally. So if we, we, we look at what happens to a, a normal athlete, for the first 30 seconds, sorry, the first five or six seconds, if you run flat out down across the park there, you'll use the ATB that's sitting in your cells. What will then happen is you'll then adopt a, a second thing which uses glycolysis to produce energy, and then you'll switch over into a, a fatty acid oxidation mechanism. So we theoretically should be able to measure each of these within the metabolome, and we can. And what we see is not on this graph, is, is another one where we look at amino acid loss from muscle, and that, that would occur the, the moment you, you, you start exercising, and it will cease the moment you stop. And then there's a two hour window in which you need to pump those things back into your cells. Then after that, that's when, the, when we saw from that other, the previous slide, that's when you tend to make creatine and, and a few other things like that. So we sort of know how this mechanism works and, and every one of us is capable of doing it. The problem is the CFS people can't get back from, from what we can see. If we, we look at AT, ATP degradation, what we can see is that we can, we can measure the hyperxanthines and the inosines. We can also measure glucose and lactate, and we can look at the urate production, allantoin, and all those other things. So we can actually measure what's actually happening to ATP. So if we look at what happens in the athletes, what you see is the hyperxanthine is elevated probably for the first 75 minutes, um, and lactate is also elevated in, in that time, but after that they both normalise. So if we inhibit glycolysis, in other words, if we've got something like a hyperglycemic event, is it going to influence that? Now there's a wonderful study done by Matsumoto at only nine, way back in 1979, and when they looked at if they inhibited glycolysis, did they get an increase in ATP breakdown? And the answer is yes, they did. And you can see that ionosine, hyperxanthine, and adenine are all elevated. So the next thing is we need to have a look at one of the things I didn't mention, or I should have mentioned was one, one of the major markers for these hypermetabolic syndromes is an actual increase in heart rate. And we know that's a common feature in CFS people and if we measure them, what we find is their, their heart rates are actually elevated. So what I wanted to do was to see, using Don's standing test, if the people that had the greatest increase in heart rate between lying down and two minutes of standing what changed in their metabolism. And what we can see from this is that all those, all those amino acids in the red in the absolute serum column all correlated with the increase in heart rate. So that is entirely consistent with the catabolic state in hypermetabolic syndromes. But what you notice when we analyse it in percentage terms, only two things changed. So the problem with all the US studies is they don't have absolute data. 
what they've got is percentage data. So we're not, we will not see these amino acid flushes in the US data unless we can quantify it and qualify it, quantitate it. So what we can see from this is the increase in heart rate or to the greatest degree went with a catabolic event. That fits the hypermetabolic state. If we then turn around and we look at what happens at, this, at a similar time, what we see is the urinary excretion of all these things goes up as well. So you can see virtually all of them in the metabolite set in the middle group, that's in absolute measure, uh, it's highly significantly elevated with, with R values of 0.91, that's huge. But when you look at the percentage data, what you see is you see an, a fall in urea, a fall in acetate, and a fall in, in, in um, a, a, the degradation product of ATP. Interestingly, you also see malinate. Now, malinate is, in actual fact, a, one of the major components for fatty acid production, but is also a major component that you see elevated when there's fatty acid breakdown. So what you can see, when you compare the two, you see that the two green ones, urea and acetate, do not change statistically significantly, even though there's, sorry, the urine, sorry, the urine and the acetate are completely separately different, whereas most of the others really don't change. So the reason, part of the reason for this increase in metabolite loss appears to, to have something to do with acetate levels and also uh, the amount of um, nitrogen these people are carrying. So what this tells me is as the nitrogen urea level falls, these people are losing electrolyte. So when they have, when they have an upregulated event, what they're doing is they're urinating out all of these metabolic components they should retain. So to me, this is really a crux issue in, in the, the development of the, the long-term symptom set. Now, when I did my PhD a couple of years ago now, I've gone grey since, I think. Um, what we found is that if we looked at the duration versus the total metabolite, we found that the, the longer the duration, the lower the metabolite excretion. So what we're seeing is intermittent patterns of exacerbated release in, in the urine, and what that's resulting in long term is depletion. So what we're getting is amino acid depletion. So when we look at hyperxanthine levels, and we compare at the bottom one, which is red, the red line is, is that in the CFS people, and the top one is that in the controls, we don't see any real diversion in the ability to remake um, um, or convert hyperxanthine into, or, sorry, what we find is, I'll start again. The major difference is the, the amount of precursors. So if the precursors to make hyperxanthine are, are definitely lower in the chronic fatigue people, and therefore the ability to make this is actually reduced. So in other words, this renal loss of a metabolite seemed to have a prime reason why we no longer are able to make ATP at the levels we should be. So we then can look at if we're amino acid depleted, what's likely to happen to us? Now what this is a very complex slide, which I could give a one hour lecture on, but what in essence we can find is that um, if we look at protein synthesis, we can find in the, in the top cluster, if you have a reduced availability of amino acids, you're not going to be able to translate pro your DNA signals into protein. And that can occur from gut malabsorption, joint hypermobility disorders, inflammatory things that alter your renal function. Um, we also see changes in endoplasmic retriction protein structures. We see in the PKR, which is viral and tumour DNA and RNA being inside the cell, and, and that can change how they function properly. Uh, inflammatory cytokines, insulin and things through an mTOR pathway. 
uh, heavy metals and we saw the, the, the association with uh, mercury uh, from laurel. Um, and the other really important thing is that we can see that these things are turned off the moment you exercise. So when you perform exercise what you, within your cells, and we can see that in the earlier data, um, the protein synthesis is turned off inside a muscle cell. That allows the components to leak out in, into the cytopla out into the, into the serum. That provides amino acids and other things for the brain to use. So even a postural syndrome um, such as leaning or typing or doing things like that, all of those things are capable of influencing this. Now they're all cumulative, they're not individual things. So when you evaluate a patient, you should look at all of these potential reasons. So the, the real outcome of that is there's a reduced ability to translate DNA into protein. Right, so hypermetabolic syndromes also have gut dysfunction as a major component of their, of their, their issue. What we saw in, in our post-exertional malaise patients, and there's a paper in production somewhere out there, somebody's reviewing it in this room. Um, sorry, one of my co-authors, that is. Um, what we found is that there, there was definitely a sorry, there's a paper written by Shukla and published in 2015, and what they showed was that, that whenever they performed a, a, an exercise thing, they actually developed a bacteremia, and that bacteremia was present for at least 72 hours or greater. Uh, in the Harvard data with Wenzong, and you saw his sleep pattern things up there earlier, what we found is that the major problem we saw with those is that the majority of the top 10 components that correlated with the sleep disturbance were actually components from the gut. So th this barrier dysfunction appears to be a major precipitator of what's, what else is going on. Um, when we looked at the microbiome in our data set, uh, we didn't, it was not great in picking up symptom alteration and presentation, but what we did find is that the fecal metabolome was far superior. So in other words, the bits being made by the bugs were much better indicators than, than the bacterial species alone. So gut barrier dysfunction appears to be a major component in the maintenance of this sort of issue. So very quickly, we'll get on to genome studies. Why are they, why do not any of them find any similar genes? So what's going on here? We've got the, we've got the best technology around the planet and we can't find a consistent thing. So what I tried to do was to look for other things that might be involved. So if we look at the, the Whistler study and we look at the top 20 genes, what we found is virtually all of them uh, were, were, had H histone deacetylized binding. So that they are controlled by a fall in acetate or a manipulation of, of acetate binding to DNA. So and when we look at that, we can see that glycolysis is actually the producer. Actually, I'll go through the other ones first. The Frampton study that looked at gene upper regulation, HDAC1 and 2 were um, regulators of virtually every gene that was upregulated. Um, SPAD1, one, one, small, 4 and 5, which are bone morphic genetic proteins which turn these things on, whereas uh, HDAC1 will tend to turn them off or vice versa, depending on which genes they are. You can see that, that the acetate component here is really important. If we also look at the, the single nucleonide polymorphism, um, virtually all of them, well, they were more combined, or more associated with SMAD145 anomalies than HDA1C, but at least 75% of them were controlled by acetate. So in other words, what we're seeing is a significant change in ability to acidulate 
uh, or, and use acetate to control our metabolism. And there's just one, only one study been published so far, that was Jason et al. 2011, and they found HDAC, HDAC2 was 4.3-fold higher in their, in their CFS patients than their controls, and HDAC3 was 2.7-fold higher. So in other words, they have a acetylization problem. If we look at what controls acetate or acet uh, de histone deacetylization, it's glycolysis. So if we've got if we've got a real problem w with um, with this glucose tolerance, what we're looking at here is a, a major component or a major outcome of that inability to you know, absorb glucose, etc. And we're going to see a, a problem with acetylization. So it's going to shut down some genes, the expression of some genes, and upregulate others. Pyruvate and lactate are, in actual fact, inhibitors of HD1 and 2. So if they are low, um, there's an acetylization issue. So very quickly, we can see in, in the altered glucose state, if glucose is high, we see acetylization goes up in the, in the histones, and you get a regulation of mitochondrial function. And when, at, when glucose is low, you get a whole pile of things that get turned off. So how does acetate regulate histones? What it basically does is separate them to allow uh, the DNA reading to occur. Um, as you can see with the ones with all the little blue circles, you can see how they're much wider spaced and, and that allows uh, DNA replication. We also know that acetate is not just a DNA controller. It actually is a, it dramatically controls energy metabolism. And, you can, and basically it does that by sticking acetates onto lysine molecules on enzymes. So all of those that have lots of lysines on their surface will get acidulated and therefore those will either be turned on or turned off because of that. When we look at the types of enzymes that are regulated by acetate, we see lactate, dehyd we see dopamines in there. Interestingly, hyperxanthine phosphoribol transferase, so your ability to actually um, get to turn around and produce hyperxanthine and, and to manipulate it is actually faulty. You also notice that prostaglandin synthetase the, the, the proline dehydrogenase, which is the connective tissue issue, um, uh, upregulator, all of those fit w with the type of things we're seeing. When we look at the lipid content, what we find is the things that are really changed in the Navio data set, because I have access to all of these now. Thank you, Ron. Um, what we find in there is it's the very long chain fatty acids that are you sure about that? I won't be long. Okay, so basically it's the very long chain fatty acids that are being utilised and, and they will affect, uh, they will dysregulate peroxisomal mitochondrial uh, metabolism and they will also affect myelin production and things of that nature. If we look at the, at the other sorts of things we find, we see a significant increase in bile acids in, in the serum of these people. And what that really appears to do is, is it alters absorption of water, sodium, glucose, and some amino acids from the gut. And when, when we look at the types that are anomalous in both the Cornell data set and the Harvard data set, we see it's the taurine-based ones that are elevated and not the multitudes of other ones. And they're all somewhere between um, two and threefold higher. The other interesting thing we see is a whole series of metabolites which alter renal function. These are normal metabolites in, in people that the changes in metabolic process we're seeing means they become elevated and what they therefore do is they will go and change our re renal excretion rates. So maybe the, the dramatic increase in metabolite loss may have something to do with these.
Now, very importantly, and I probably need to keep this a bit quiet, but when we looked for environmental contaminants to see whether any of those were there, we found 4-hydroxychlorosalinol. It's actually, this is in the, Harvard, in the Cornell data set. It was, it's a fungicide and it is elevated. And when we do correlation, so that's, that's the one in red. And you can see there's some quite significant outliers on, on that. What, what we see when we correlate that back against metabolic change, we see the prominent things that are changed are carnitine-based metabolites. Um, they, the precursors for carnitine seem to be elevated, and carnitine itself seems to be much lower. So that tells me immediately that we're likely to have a mitochondrial fatty acid beta oxidation problem. The other thing that we saw elevated, and this is in the green one, is phosphofluorooctanosulfonic acid. It's called Scotchgard, made by 3M. It is no longer on the market. It was removed in, I think, in 2002. Every patient we looked at has it in their serum. All of us in this room will have it in our serum. And when we looked at what it correlated with, we saw increases in allantoin, we saw increases in the proline P5C uh, hydroxyproline, and we saw alterations in glucose. So these things, so-called environmental contaminants, uh, which we all have, may be playing a significant role in why some of these people have a problem. Is that all right? I'm happy to answer questions. I think I've said all that anyhow. Yes, yeah, so we have time for one very quick question. And then um, we can ask questions in the break as well. While we're waiting, uh, I have to thank the Stanford Collaboration for including me and allowing me to put this hypothesis before you. I want it tested. I, I want you, it, it'll be an evolving event and we will adjust things, we will find subclusters, we'll find other genetic components that will interfere and be part of that. So let's get on and do it. On the lack of other questions, just having been involved in this research for a very long time, just how do you see things going forward, either your own work or also broadly the whole collaboration effort? The biggest question is, money. We have all the ideas we need and collectively with Wen Zong and a few of the others, we, we know what we need to do. We just need to organise appropriate sets of studies. We need to get people with expertise in all the appropriate areas and we just need to get on and do it. Yeah. 